Okay, very good morning to you. It's Tuesday 28th of April, hope you're doing well. Um, first thing I just want to mention is obviously we've got the latest FOMC meeting happening tomorrow night, Wednesday, and we're going to be covering that live via an exclusive kind of webinar using Zoom video technology. Um, so on the link to this video, I'm going to put a registration link. Uh, feel free to, to join us, absolutely. We're going to cover that. Um, it's going to be me, Will, Piers, Sam, everyone's going to be on board. We're going to talk a little bit as well as the title would suggest, not only about covering the latest Fed announcement, uh, but also a little bit about trading psychology. So I'll share the link with everyone. Everyone is welcome to join, but obviously anyone new to Amplify, I think this would be a really good session to hear from all the members of the team uh, and also to see us cover a news-driven event uh, and being a, a kind of macro fundamental firm in terms of what's core to our trading strategies, it'll probably be a good um, session for you to, to see how we go about things. So yeah, I'll drop the link in the video. So please do register and join us tomorrow night if you are free. Uh, but moving on, let's have a look at markets and let's have a look what's going on. And generally a higher close on Wall Street last night. Um, the S&P Dow finishing up approximately 1.5%, the Nasdaq a little bit lower, but still positive territory. Um, most of that coming you know, from a top level on the underpinned by sentiment, improving a little bit about economies talking about the easing of their lockdown measures across the globe in various different areas. Uh, so equities generally a little bit were a little bit more buoyant, T-notes down, and you can see this morning uh, a little bit of follow through, equities generally holding on to that move. Uh, the DAX you can see in the center left here, just forming a nice little base with some of the recent price action you can see from those highs that we were printing uh, in yesterday morning's high initially when Europe came in uh, just ahead of the cash open in the futures market uh, and then again when the US came in before that eventual break. So really nice technical level of uh, of interest there for support now in the DAX having played out quite nicely in yesterday's uh, futures market. Uh, with that then T-notes pretty much flat but as I said holding on to losses uh, that were seen yesterday and gold continues to unwind some of its kind of premium if you like on the flight to quality status just as risk sentiment or appetite just picks up. Um, $1,700 uh, the next kind of uh, level beyond that of then the S2 which is where we've seen a bit of a bounce already this morning in the future so trading at 1710. Uh, currency markets not too much going on. Uh, I did hear the squawk talking about um, citing Barclays for a month end flow, something to just be mindful of as we go into obviously the end of April, going into Friday being the 1st of May. Uh, they've been talking about the potential for some uh, down, moderate downside in the dollar as we go into that month end. So nothing to apply immediately right now, but if that is going to be the case, uh, you might well see a little bit of downward pressure uh, over the next kind of 48 hours or so, so worth bearing that in mind with the major pairs. Um, Euro dollar just forming a bit of a nice base around uh, the low that was seen yesterday just after Europe exited the market, had a bit of a retest of that late Asia Pacific session uh, around that 108.28 mark. Um, oil prices probably a bit of a standout, I'm going to talk about that a little bit more but obviously a bit of an unwinding of those June futures contract from the US oil fund yesterday uh, and we provided uh, a nice kind of setup here. That previous low we had on the 23rd in the overnight session, uh, we broke below that uh, yesterday afternoon. Obviously, came back up to that level, similar price point, albeit a little bit choppy around the 6 p.m. mark. And then we've kind of uh, come all the way back down under pressure. A little bit exacerbated by the overnight conditions, of course, in the Asia Pacific session, uh, managing to break that yesterday afternoon low. And that just saw us tumble from around $12 all the way down to sub 11 for a moment. Uh, and that's kind of where we trade at the moment, bang on 11 bucks down close to $2 for the session. Let's just run through some of the headlines then and the calendar of what have we got on the agenda. A uh, quick update on COVID-19. Um, this is going to focus on the UK. I know a lot of the followers of this channel are based in the UK. Uh, so you know, as much as I can talk about markets, I think it's worthwhile just for our own personal sake to know where we're at at the moment. Uh, and obviously Boris Johnson returning to work. Uh, after his his period with dealing with the virus himself over recent weeks. Uh, UK, there were 360 hospital deaths from the disease yesterday, and that was the lowest daily number since the 28th of March. Um, while the seven-day average is showing a gradual decline in mortality, Johnson said that lifting um, the curbs too early would risk a second spike in the infections. 
the chief medical officer Chris Whitty warned the coming months are fraught with uncertainty so definitely a bit of a different tone um, from the likes of, uh, of, of Boris Whitty probably slightly more consistent in that sense but um, trying to give the, the general public the overall reality check that I think is probably uh, necessary in order for them to, to manage what's like to be a very gradual uh, return to normality over an extended period of time. Um, Witty did say that they're definitely not consistently past the peak um, across the whole country. Uh, the government is due to review restrictions at the end of the week. There's been quite a few reports. I think the Times talking about that Johnson's going to give more details um, later on this week. So something to be looking out for. Uh, Sunak, the, the Chancellor, of course, he announced a programme of government-backed microloans for the UK's smallest businesses, talking about a very fast track turnaround for applications of, I think it was up to £50,000 sterling. But again, the idea being to support those that really uh, backstop a lot of the, the country's employment levels, being the smaller firms. Uh, so that's kind of where we're at with that at the moment. Um, with that in mind, I did actually tweet, um, and you probably saw it, um, again, my, my handle's there if you, if you didn't want to follow my ramblings on, on Twitter. Uh, but yesterday, the Telegraph were putting out what their kind of criteria for lockdown ending measures. And this was their kind of five point plan, uh, protecting the NHS, consistent decline in death rates, lower infection rates across the board, testing and PPE issues under control and prevention of a second peak. So the point I was making yesterday is that I do you find it quite hard for them to be too aggressive with the uh, winding down of lockdown given the fact that I would say on most of those five points they're currently not quite there yet. Uh, so this is the kind of benchmark or I guess reference point that you'd be looking at to ascertain how, where are we where are we at this point in time and how close are we to that point. Uh, but again Johnson's like to give an update uh, given the pressure he's under from not just the public but also business communities in order to, to get the economy reopened. Um, elsewhere, oil prices, uh, as I just said to you, uh, WTI in, in terms of the June futures contract getting hammered yesterday again. Uh, obviously, not quite as violent as what we saw last week, but you know we are or we have gone from uh, where we were at the beginning of reo uh, reopening of electronic trade Sunday night from around plus sixteen dollars to trading now sub eleven. Uh, so, what exactly has been going on? Well, the U.S. oil fund. Uh, United States oil fund, the USO otherwise as it's known, uh, unexpectedly began selling its holdings of the most active uh, contract, that being now the de facto kind of uh, front month June futures. Uh, the ETF now has changed its investment policy five times in the last two weeks and that's incredible uh, in terms of them trying to mitigate this, this kind of run if you like on those near-term contracts. Uh, and looking to spread the average duration out now, going out for, I think it's up until the next 12 months or so. Um, an interesting point that I read in the Bloomberg article to, to be aware of, uh, and obviously everyone's been quite uh, sensitive to this situation about coming up to maximum capacity uh, of Cushing. Uh, and again, there's another tweet I did yesterday, probably graphically can, can help explain that. Uh, and this is where we were at as of April 17th. So obviously, you know, things have got even more tight on capacity since that point but you can see here this is from the EIA weekly commercial crude oil infantries at Cushing in Oklahoma uh, and the working storage capacity is around 76 million so this is that green line and you can see here how rapidly uh, storage capacity has been diminishing and that meaning that within three to four weeks we would probably hit that green line hence the reason why people have been panicking in the last week or so on this point though South Korea which is the fourth um, biggest commercial storage capacity in Asia uh, was said to have run out of onshore space run by two big operators elsewhere Singapore's coastline has become even more congested with oil laden tankers so again they're just literally just sitting there uh, at the moment uh, and which obviously comes at quite a cost uh, in order to avoid the US hub of Cushing becoming more than 90% full uh, in June May and June essentially um, that's oil. So could we see more downside uh, in the June contract? I'd say likely probably to be the case. Um, again, if the USO had now exited all those positions, it's unlikely that anyone, uh, any other type of investor, particularly a speculator, 
uh, which predominantly backstops a lot of these futures contracts, is going to be want to be caught in this big negative route in prices that we had before. Very tricky to try and get out of those positions. Uh, so that might mean that there's just a real lack of buyers and, and that might force the price back down. And obviously, uh, when that does happen, it can happen very quickly if it is quite illiquid in that front month's contract. Um, elsewhere, next story of note, Federal Reserve last night came out with some more news. So if you thought uh, they'd taken every step possible, well, they've just gone another step further. Uh, they've expanded the scope and duration, as you can see here from the headlines, of the Municipal Liquidity Facility a $500 billion emergency lending program for state and local governments is what this is. So a couple of details here. Uh, they lowered the population thresholds under which counties and cities would be eligible to sell short-term debt to the facility. Uh, a new term sheet for the program also adds a so-called fallen angel provision, something you might have seen a video on our channel from my colleague Eddie talking about. And this basically allowing some issuers whose credit ratings were downgraded after April 8th to qualify, provided they had been rated investment grade by two agencies as of that date. Um, so making these exceptional rules in order for it to be more accommodating to to help then on a more kind of county and city based level. Earnings wise, it's been quite a lot actually uh, to look out for today. Uh, HSBC has already come out. I uh, haven't heard of any pre-market calls as yet ahead of the cash open. I mean, I'm filming this shortly after 7 a.m. London time. Um, HSBC expected credit losses swelled to $3 billion in Q1, almost double estimates. Uh, the bank said that 2020 credit losses could swell to 7 to $11 billion US dollars. Adjusted pre-tax profit missed consensus estimate. Um, but like other banks, it has kind of make, made hay with the, the kind of turbulent nature of markets, particularly through that period of the back end of Q1 in March. Uh, they saw a 25% gain in revenue in its global markets unit. Uh, the bank's medium-term financial targets are going to be assessed uh, during the year. Their dividend will be reviewed at or ahead um, of their year-end results of 2020 is what they're saying at the moment. Uh, the bank pushing ahead as, or pushing back sorry, uh, with its restructuring program to deal with the virus at the moment. Other banking names that have been out this morning, UBS, they reported lower credit losses than their peers, including Credit Suisse. Um, but sees major income streams being hurt by the impact of, of COVID-19. And then one other European name uh, headline I saw this morning on Reuters, Germany has agreed to help the airline Lufthansa um, with a rescue package worth 9 billion euros. And they're called up about 2% last time that I saw uh, ahead of the market open. In terms of corporate earnings uh, for today, this is just looking at the most anticipated earning releases in the US pre-market. Uh, I'm going to focus on the pre-market because people like Alphabet, for example, which are um, due to come out after market, I'll be talking about those more um, later on today. But for the pre-market names, this is a bit small to see, but I did tweet this graphic out if you need it um, in a bit more detail. Uh, but essentially, a few names that I am particularly um, interested to see how the results come out as. Um, 3M, Caterpillar and Pfizer. Now these are the kind of the larger market cap names uh, pre-market. They are the ninth, 14th and 29th biggest companies listed in the Dow Jones Industrial Average. They account for approximately 8.6% of the entire Dow index reporting ahead of the opening bell. So definitely worth keeping an eye on the Dow futures uh, ahead of the, the formal kind of US open. A uh, few things then. Uh, as I was talking about this with some of the, the kind of junior traders yesterday, uh, Caterpillar is quite an interesting one for a macro based kind of trader or analyst. Uh, Caterpillar can be quite telling in terms of its um, rolling machine orders. We tend to see them broken down into certain geographic areas like North, South Americas, uh, the Asia Pacific region, Europe, and so on. And that gives us a really nice insight as to generally them being one of the largest industrial stocks to give an insight how to the pandemic is hitting the sector. Um, you know, the heavy machinery maker is expected to post a 42% drop in first quarter profit and 18% decline in their revenues. And they, they are very kind of telling, I guess, in terms of their performance, in terms of the, the state of play economically acting as that kind of bellwether measurement for, for general sentiment at that, 
that point in time. Their outlook as well will be of particular interest. Um, you know, this is some of the key uh, differences, I guess. So, you know, we are not trading single stocks, but um, does that mean that I ignore single company news? Absolutely not. I guess the, the basic lesson here is about defining then who has large index market weightings. If there's a cumulative larger proportion as there is today with roughly 9% or so of the Dow reporting, that's obviously going to be potentially meaningful for the futures market. You know, and then you have certain companies that can act as bellwethers, as I said, like Caterpillar. Um, tomorrow you get Boeing pre-market. Now, now Boeing, obviously, particularly large as a company, quite highly ranked in the Dow in terms of where it sits in the order and the hierarchy. Um, and particularly because you know a company like Boeing, not only does it have you know circa 150,000 staff worldwide, but they also work with around 17,000 suppliers who are linked to the company. Uh, and dependent on how well Boeing is doing is a little bit of an indicator then to the potential ramifications for the employment sector from a macro point of view um, for the US economy. So, you know, these are the ways and means in which a macro kind of trader would look at this type of information, um, as well as going through the kind of line by line financial statement. Uh, it's more about, you know, that kind of um, implications for the general economic read across from the numbers we're seeing and also from any potential index moving point of view which they've, they've generally got to be a larger market cap or kind of dominant within a fairly small sector um, as we're going to see i think amd is another name that's coming out uh, as well uh, this week all right so yeah, here, here's the full kind of uh, list of timings. Uh, the first bigger companies start kicking off at around 11.25 a.m. London time. You've got PepsiCo, Caterpillar, 3M. You've also got big farm stocks, so Pfizer, Merck, pre-market, uh, UPS as well, all ahead of the opening bell. Then after market, probably the main ones you're looking out for, Alphabet, Starbucks, Mondelez, uh, and then actually AMD is reporting after market today, in fact. Uh, but again, I'll go after, uh, over the aftermarket ones a bit later. Um, from a calendar point of view, what have we got? Um, not really a great deal here. Certainly nothing of stature coming out of the UK and Europe today. Um, then going into the US afternoon, no major, uh, really major 130s. Um, you've got the advanced goods trade balance number. And then you've got the US consumer confidence number at 3 p.m. And then the weekly oil inventories from the API coming um, later on in the evening. So that's pretty much it. I'm uh, just going to quickly go back to this screen. Again, I'll drop the link on the video. Uh, we're going to be doing that broadcast live from 6.30 p.m. London time. So give us a half an hour run in to explain how we're going to tackle that release and then we'll cover it live. We're going to do a bit of a session with Will as well on trading psychology. Uh, so absolutely feel free to register and join us. I look forward to talking to you then. But otherwise, have a good day ahead. Any questions on, on what I've covered, just feel free to leave a comment on the video. I'm happy to help. All right, guys, have a good day.